Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Summer squash is good to eat. We'll show you how to make squash casserole. Also, we'll talk about the ins and outs of pollination. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Kathy Faust. Ms. Kathy is a UT Extension agent right here in Shelby County. And Carol Reese is with us today. Carol is the horticulture specialist with UT Extension. Thanks for joining me, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. All right, squash casserole, Ms. Kathy. And uh, I think myself and Ms. Carol, we can't wait <laughs> okay. to taste it at the end. Yeah. So what do we need to do to get started? Well, I have been preparing this recipe for over 20 years for that? my FCE ladies. And actually, it does require some preparation, which is why I say if you're going to fa fix this, make a lot. Okay. Because you can put it in small casseroles in the freezer. But the first thing that we need to do is spray the bottom of a 9 by 13 inch okay, spray the bottom. baking right. dish. We're going to spray that. Because we don't want that to stay, right? Right. Okay. And we're going to prepare our topping. And the <laughs> topping is four cups of crumbled cornbread with about a half a cup of melted butter. And the original recipe called for one stick of melted, <laughs> wow. melted butter. So I have cut, I've really cut back, cut back. Okay. on the butter. <laughs> but the first thing we're going to do is just go ahead and, and put about half of this. So that's cornbread the, you already cooked and now you've crumbled it and then added the butter. Exactly. Okay. And let me mention to you, you see this little jiffy cornbread that I have here? Mm -hmm. One box is not going to make about oh, wow. four cups. You're going to have to use two boxes of this to get your four cups. But don't crumble everything at once. Just kind of um, test it as you go. But see, you want to have enough to cover the, the bottom, bottom of your okay. dish. Mm -hmm. And then in the meantime, you can start boiling your squash and fixing the low-fat sausage. I like to use the low fat okay. sausage and it's, it's just so easy to do. Our recipe calls for two cups of yellow squash which is cooked, drained, and mashed. Now that looks the, good. Thank you. The best <laughs> way to cook your squash is actually to steam it for about three minutes. I went ahead and I boiled this and naturally you know I lost some of the nutritive value of it but they recommend that you steam it for about three minutes. Okay. So we've got two cups of squash. If I were going to freeze this casserole, I probably would not have boiled the squash as long as I did, mm -hmm. maybe five minutes, so it has some um, texture to it. So we've got our squash. And, and while we're talking about the squash, mm -hmm. what about some of the benefits? Oh, I squash. love squash. <laughs> I, they, well, you know, they want us to go to a plant-based diet. Good. And I grew up on this sort of thing. We were vegetarians and didn't even know it. But we wow. had vegetables at most of our meals, no meat. And this has about 36 calories per cup. Mm. Um, this is before we add the butter. <laughs> uh, and it has a lot of antioxidants. Okay. You hear so much about antioxidants. Sure. Well, what do they do? They protect the cells. Okay. And so many people that I talk with now have diabetes, yes. diabetes 2, yes. and this is something that sort of helps keep their blood sugar level in check. Mm. So we're talking about it has a lot of fiber, it's got vitamin C, uh, low calories, mm. and then two, the antioxidants. Okay. And that goes for all of your summer squashes. I stopped by the Big Red Barn this morning and I picked up some patty pan squash, zucchini, this, Eight ball squash. Oh, I've wow, never like seen that. this That's before. Eight ball she squash. said just slice it and, and fry it up. Looks good. So uh, it has a lot of nutritive value. Yes, so we've got our two cups of squash. And again, the recipe called for one stick of butter. In the recipe we'll be sampling, I cut it back to about a half a stick. 
but let's just go ahead and leave it out completely okay. and you will taste the difference because butter adds so much good flavor. Mm -hmm. But we're going to leave out mm -hmm. the butter. Now, the soup, your recipe calls for two cans. Of, you can either use cream of chicken soup or I've substituted cream of celery soup. But when I was fixing this recipe, I was out of soup except for chicken with herbs, mm. <laughs> and I love it. So now this is what I use all the time. Oh. Although the herbs. recipe calls for cream of mushroom, okay. cream of chicken, I just use two so cups. substitute that. Yeah, okay. cream of chicken with herbs. See, you can just put your own personality into sure. this. And then one medium onion, finely chopped. And if you're gonna do this, just go ahead and use your food processor and chop up lots of onions, and you can put that in the freezer. About one teaspoon of sugar, Mm. And you can leave the sugar out, but that, that just adds a little flavor sugar. to it. And then, lastly, we stir in one pound of the ground sausage. And like I said, this is the low-fat sausage. What I like to do, I just put it in the oven, and I might triple this recipe. I put it in the oven, I've got a big food processor, and then I run all of this through the food process. So have you pre-cooked that sausage? Oh yeah, you have to pre-cook <laughs> okay. the, pre the sausage right. and then it will be hard. So just go ahead and put those little clumps into your food processor. Oh, uh, break it and, up, I got you. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay. So you're okay. just gonna go ahead and mix all of this together. Okay, now it's ready. Okay, so you would just spread that in? That's all we're gonna do okay. is just spoon this on top. Wow. See, that makes it easy. And like I said, if you're going to go ahead and do this casserole, make several. You can make them in the smaller casseroles. You just spread it out there. Right. See, you spread that out. Okay. Scott, you've done this a time or two. Oh, mm -hmm. golly, I have made this so many times. Okay. And then we're going to top it with some more of this cornbread. Uh -huh. I and like see. Tiffy mix, too. Oh. Yeah. Do you? I do. I'm a Martha White person myself. Uh, <laughs> I did a lot of Jiffy in college, of course. Did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Limited money, you know, so I like the Jiffy mix. Mm -hmm. And you just spread that out. Now, you're supposed to cook this at 375 for about 30 minutes uncovered. And I'm going to show you the difference. You, you really need to cook it uncovered because when you're done, let me show you how beautifully the top browns. I just happened to have one here that I did this morning. Did you right. did you say the temperature and I just was? 375 Three. degrees. Okay. Now this says for about 30 minutes, but I cooked mine closer to one hour. Okay. okay. So Ms. Kathy, can we go ahead and taste that while we have this little You sure left? can. Okay. Yes, Shall indeed. Shall I pass that over to you? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. This, this is our finished product. Yeah. Wow, that is pretty. Okay. Oh, that looks good. Can y'all get a look at that? That looks good. Mm -hmm. Good color. All right, Miss Carol, let's get a taste of that. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. That looks good, Miss Kathy. Thank you. And here again, we're talking about something that comes fresh out of the garden. Yeah. You know, your squash. Oh my gosh, yeah. when, it's, when it starts coming, it really oh, starts it coming. Comes. Oh, here you go. Mm -hmm. Chris, okay. Let me get Thank you. A spoon. Here you go. Thank Excuse you. me for reaching. Oh, no. Thank you. Let me give this a taste. Here. It looks good. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Mm. That is good. That's really good. We appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Mm. The casserole is very, very tasty. Thank you. It is. Thanks for the lunch. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Ms. Carol, let's talk pollination. So where do you want to start with that? Well, I, you know, it's the birds and the bees mm -hmm. and the flowers and the trees right. and all that stuff. That's, <laughs> that's kind of what's going on out there. 
uh, in the Garden of Eden is things are making new babies. Right. So it's all about that, and I think a lot of people forget that, that flowers are reproductive organs, and <laughs> but it gets complicated. It gets complicated because a lot of times um, there's different strategies for those flowers to get pollinated. Okay. So this, first of all, I think the thing to think about is whether they're wind-pollinated or insect-pollinated. Okay. Because the insect pollinated flowers want to have big, showy, colorful petals to attract those insects or hummingbirds or right. even bats can be pollinators. Bats? Bats are Did pollinators for some, okay. especially in tropical regions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but with the wind pollinated, you don't want petals. You don't want showy petals. Because it, let's think about this. Let's say wind pollinated things are very common in, say, a prairie setting. Oh, okay. And you want that pollen to blow. Oh, There's lots cool. of pollen. You're a little female flower and you're swaying in the wind. You're <laughs> hoping for a piece of pollen to land on your sticky stigma. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a shame if a showy petal blocked it just as it yeah, got right. to you? So it would actually be a detriment. Okay. So, gotcha. But the reason that a lot of times in your tropical regions you have the bigger showier flowers, think how poor wind pollination would work yeah. in that setting because the pollen would stick to the next wet leaf mm -hmm. okay, I and not make it to the, to the little sense. female part of the flower. Wow. So. Okay. so then it gets even more complicated than that because, <clears throat> of course, as you know, with a lot of plants you'll have separate sexes on different mm -hmm. plants. You'll have a male, and persimmon is one I always like to talk about because okay. it's a favorite tree of mine. But there's a male tree and there's a female tree, and they've got to tango yeah. to make persimmon fruits. So they're, uh, they're usually bee pollinated. There can be some wind pollination in those as well. But they have to be close enough for that to happen. But with other trees, both sexes are present on the same mm -hmm. uh, tree. And apple's a good example. Okay. And as you know, with your fruit, fruit background, the uh, apple flower is what we call a perfect right. flower because it's both male and female. It has all the parts it needs right within that one flower. On some trees, like an oak tree, there are both sexes present on that tree, but the flowers are actually very different. The male flowers are those little catkins uh -huh. that fall all over your windshield, and the female flowers are pretty inconspicuous. They yeah, look like little small. tiny acorns, or yeah. the pecans are the same way. So that's uh, just a whole other way of, of thinking about it. With the ones that are insect pollinated, there are different strategies for attracting particular insects. Um, you know, I think on a recent segment we talked about the pawpaw, right. for example, and the pawpaw flower, to attract its pollinators, which are flies and beetles, it would smell sort of interesting. <laughs> it wouldn't uh, smell sweet. It would smell more like, they call it smelling more like meat. Yeah. To me it oh, smells a little goodness. bit more like yeasty, but there are a lot of flowers that do smell like dead rotting meat. <clears throat> There's one even called carrion flower. And that's to attract those pollinators. But with um, <laughs> <Wow>. moths, <laughs> moths find flowers by fragrance, by scent. And, of course, moths are usually active at night, so that's okay. very important for them to have a strong, sweetly scented flower. And they usually smell like the smell we associate with jasmine. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, honeysuckle, gardenia, oh, jasmine, like that strong, mm -hmm. sweet very penetrating smell will attract moths from great distances to do the pollinating. Okay. And they're usually white or light yellow. They're a light color, taking them a little more visible in the night as well. So, wow. Yeah. How about that? It's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. It is. You like that, Miss Kathy? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Uh, we have some real specialists out there that are sort of strange, too. Um, <laughs> the jewelweed, for example, and the cardinal flower yeah. are both examples of late summer bloomers that are especially attractive to hummingbirds. And the hummingbird's head is especially adapted to fit into those flowers. And they're also an example of a strange flower that does the things, it changes sex. It starts out life as a male flower. So it's giving pollen. The little hummingbird's poking his head in there. He's bumping pollen on his head. Right. Mm -hmm. He's taking it to the next flower, and he's pollinating. Well, that flower, at some point in its life, drops the male parts off, and the female parts are waiting behind it. They're actually pushing the male parts wow, off. So They're right like, behind it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so for a couple of days, it's delivering pollen. Mm -hmm. Then and it's receiving it's pollen. So here comes the hummingbird again, and they can go ahead and make seed and set seed. So it's basically it's a transgender flower. 
And that's just an interesting thing that goes on right out in our ditches that a lot of people may not realize. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think people know that. It's fun, isn't it, to wow. think about all these crazy oh, reproductive yeah. strategies. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll be doing a talk on this very subject oh. for our summer celebration right. this year. Uh -huh. This is uh, 2015. It'll be July 9th this year, okay. always the second Thursday. I'm calling that talk Sex in the Garden, <laughs> which may sound a little racy, but it's really about the interesting pollination strategies that these critters take and the interactions between them and even some of the sex lives of the critters that live in our gardens okay. the frogs the dragonflies the toads all that fun stuff so i'm going to work all that into it right all the sounds we hear out in the garden yeah you know? those are the yeah, males the yelling for come on girls <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting on that's what the cicadas right the cicadas this right, year, right exactly that's exactly Mating. the males they're that's trying right. to mate some flowers also have an interesting ability to actually count the number of pollen grains that are delivered to oh, them that. and once they get uh, enough where they've got enough seeds to make I always call it they're they're pregnant enough okay they're going to make enough babies that they actually shut down and will no longer allow the bees to pollinate them anymore they can actually either close or the female part will get into a place on the flower where the male where the bee can no longer touch it so oh. it can't put any more pollen grains on it it's like mm, I'm done it's all, that's it, yeah. all the seeds I can handle isn't that cool? <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh huh. You could do a course on this, couldn't you? I would love to do it. I probably should do a little. There actually was a book I read years ago called Sex in the Garden. Okay. And it was by a woman, believe it or not, named Angela Overy. Oh, wow. Okay. But that kind of got me more interested in researching this topic, and I've decided, you know, it's something people really need to know. It's important in landscape plants because yeah. a lot of times we need to decide whether we want the male or the, the female because yeah. the female can have messy fruit. Sometimes you want the fruit on the female, but it means you have to have a male around to tango with her. Yeah. So hollies are a good hollies, example. Hollies, yeah, just, yeah, just to make sure about. that you've got the fruit. But things like ginkgo, the fruit is stinky. Yeah. And you don't want it. You want to be sure that you get right. the male. So it's really important to know these things. So it's things. the female fruit for the ginkgo that's stinky. Right. Well, I think fruit is mm -hmm. babies. Maybe. So right. babies are female. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing I kind of, one reason I call it sex in the garden. So people yeah. kind of make those relationships. It makes right. sense it makes if you sense. think about it. Right. Okay. And you know, pollination is pretty important in the vegetable garden as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You and I both know a lot of times we get calls about yes. that. Well, I want my squash set fruit. Well, yes. I want my tomato set yes. fruit. <laughs> And then you find out they're going out there religiously spraying for insects. Yes. And you're saying, well, you know, some of that you may need to monitor for insects, but you also need to think about your pollinators mm -hmm. and be sure you time your spray so that you're not damaging your pollinators. Right. And if you don't have those pollinators, can't you go back and forth? You know, with a uh, Q-tip or a little brush or something. Right. You can yeah. play bee. Yeah. You can play bee. You right. can be the bee. <laughs> That's absolutely true. So. Yeah. It's really fun. Some plants, too, don't want to be self-pollinated. I kind of joke about this. I call it preventing incest. Okay. For example, <laughs> the pecan tree has what we were talking about, the male flower yeah. and the female flower on the same tree, but it doesn't want to be self-pollinated. It wants to get genes from a different tree. Okay. So it has a bloom cycle where the male flowers will bloom before the females on that tree. And you need to plant it with a pecan tree that has the opposite happening. Opposite. Okay. That has the female, female. flower happening right. before the male, so that way they can get together, but they're uh -huh. exchanging genes rather than pollinating themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of other strategies like that that wow. prevent the plant from self-pollinating, and I call it like, you know, it's just not a good idea for you to keep it in the family. How about that? Mm -hmm. How interesting is that? Yeah, Isn't that, that interesting? Is. All right. Mm -hmm. Pollination, birds and the bees, folks. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's our Q&A session. All right. Ms. Kathy, you jump in there with us now. Okay. We have something to say. <laughs> All right, here's our first viewer email and some great questions this time around. Since last year, I have been spraying oil spray on my trees. Seems like some of the scales are dying, but some are still there. How long do I have to keep spraying oil? Are there any other ways to get rid of these scales? Okay, and this is from Carl in Olive Branch, Mississippi. But here's my first question for Mr. Carl. What plant material are we talking about? Right. Because that's going to affect the type of scale. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And some scale are more susceptible to oil yes. than others are not. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have to know that first and foremost. Um, do we want to use an example, I guess? Well, euonymus scale, euonymus scale. Good. is a common one. Um, and it's also about the timing of that spray because you want to do that horticultural spray, horticultural oil spray, when the crawlers are active. Right. To, to, if it's already got that protective coating, then a lot of times it's not of any, any benefit. So he's got to know his pest yes. and when to target it. 
And sometimes it takes a little bit of a, you know, trapping using sticky tape mm -hmm. and stuff to see when the crawlers are active. Yeah. And the oil pretty much was just, just suffocates right. the scales, just covers up those air holes, yes. those pores, mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, suffocates them. So, yeah, we have to know plant material. Yes. You know, first and foremost. Um, and there are some systemics that will control scale, but we have to know which one right. because some do, some don't. So it's just a little bit, take that to your county agent, let them yes. identify what you've got, then they can make the proper recommendations. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you have it, Mr. Carl. All right. Here's our next question. I planted two red maple trees about five years ago. They have grown very tall. How long would it take the maples to turn red or will they ever do so? And this is from Craig. All right. I'm puzzled. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if he's confusing them with a red leafed Japanese maple, which would be red. Hmm. Um, red maple isn't red except in the fall uh -huh. Uh -huh. when it gets uh -huh. its red fall color. It can have some red new growth or a reddish tint to the petioles, but I'm wondering if he's got a little bit of confusion going on there. So uh, I'm not sure. If, if he got a named variety of red maple, Acer rubrum, and right. I know we have to get a little picky sometimes about the scientific uh, name yeah. to make sure that they've gotten what we think they're talking about. Right. Um, then it was probably a named variety that should have good red fall color. So I'm not real sure what happened there unless there's some he dug up in the wild. And I've seen red maples in the wild that don't necessarily get good fall color. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. How about that? So let's find out what he's got. All right, and again, there you go, Mr. Craig. We need county to find agent. out. Yeah, you're a county agent. We need to find out what you have. So <laughs> Even if he uh, just takes pictures and emails. It. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and you can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, yeah, just email that to your county agent. Yes. Yeah, we can get this uh, problem solved for you there, Mr. Craig. All right, here's our next question. Again, another good question. Do variegated varieties need more or less sunlight than non-variegated varieties? And this is from uh, Lori. Well, I have found that a lot of variegated plants suffer from too much sun. Okay. Uh, that white doesn't seem to handle the hot sun very well. A lot of times they can look kind of blistered or brown up once it gets into the late part of summer. Yeah. But you put right. them in too much shade, you kind of lose the variegation. They'll kind of tend to go more green than variegated. And of course, the reason you wanted that plant was that exciting color variegation on it. Yeah. So it's kind of finding that happy medium. And uh, it depends on the plant. Again, some can take full sun just fine. Others need a little bit of afternoon shade. I would say your best bet would be half a day. Half a day, yeah. And morning sun would be ideal. That hot afternoon sun might burn it a bit. Right, and we get some blazing you know, yes. afternoon sun here in Shelby County. Right. Um, I had a professor uh, tell us one day in class that the reason why you have the white color is because there's a presence, uh, absence of pigment. Right. Okay, and of course that will show up as white. Yes. Uh, so no chlorophyll. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I always thought that was interesting when I first saw, you know, a variegated leaf. It is, and that's yeah. one reason they normally don't grow as fast or as vigorous right, as the straight tells. green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting. It is. Yeah. I'm glad I recall that. I never thought just sitting at the class that that would come back up again. How about that? Uh -huh, it does. Yeah, and it, it does. It has mm -hmm. a way of coming back. All right, Ms. Lawyer, hope that answers your question. All right, here's our next question. I need a fast-growing evergreen plant to serve as a privacy fence. Any suggestions? Well, and we're getting that question a lot now. Right. Um, what does that say about us as a society? I guess we, we don't want folks, you know, <laughs> peeking in. No, and all no. That kind of I, I would be, I'd feel that way, too, if I okay. lived near neighbors. I would need some privacy. Yeah. My problem with that question is the word A. A. I need a, a plant. A, yeah. At all costs, never, ever do your screen in a single species planting because we never know what new disease is coming down yeah. the pipe, what new pest is coming mm -hmm. down. We've seen wave after wave yeah. of new pest and disease yeah. over the... I feel like I'm talking too much. No, no, you're yeah. fine. No, no, no. Uh -huh. you're fine. So, you're fine. so you're fine. mix it up, mix it up, mix it up is the lesson that we should have learned. Um, a mixed planting will... That way, if you do have a plant death, it's not going to mess up the whole design or you're not going to lose your whole screen. If it's going to march right down from one plant to the next, you're going to lose your whole <laughs> yeah. screen, as we've yeah. seen happen with... Arborvitae. And... Leland's. Leland Cypress. Leland's, yeah. you know, yeah. they get the ceridium right. canker. So that's also more interesting to me to look at a mixed edge. If you look at a woodland's edge, you see different shapes and habits and foliage textures. Yeah. So why not have a more interesting looking screen, plus you're hedging your bets. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Okay. And you have a list you could send them. Yes, I do. 
I yeah, have shared that. Office. Yes, and I do have that list. The woody plant class, I give a list of for screens, mm -hmm. plants, even ones that will tolerate shade or wet areas that they could find locally that will work well in their mixed screen planting, plus some tips on design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do have that list, so uh, contact me at the office and I can get that to you. Very okay. good. Yeah. Because you are a horticulture specialist. Well, so you're fine. I hope I know something by now. I hope so. <laughs> I think you do. I, I think you know a lot. Oh, Chris, thank I you. I think you do. Well, look, Ms. Carol, it's got to be out of time. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.